welcome. Welcome to the CILT Brexit Readiness Training on Customs Impact Post-Brexit. My name is Toby Thompson. I'm here at Cranford University. I'm joined by Susan Morley. More on Susan in a second. Susan is our resident expert in the CILT for all things customs. This session should be around about 90 minutes, nine zero minutes. So uh, please free your timetables. Please put your phones on divert. Do what you want to do. But we do want your questions throughout this session. This is an interactive session. You'll get more from Susan, who is really an expert in customs post-Brexit. Uh, so please pose your questions to us. And to do that, you'll find the text chat panel at the bottom of the screen, somewhere down here. If you find a um, speech bubble icon, click that. The text chat panel will open up to the right of your screens. Please, any questions, observations, challenges, uh, please type them into there. And then I'll read those out to Susan as we go. So Susan, mm -hmm. you're a Chartered Fellow of CILT, if I've got that right, and you are Chair of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport's Custom Forum. Say That's a bit more about the Custom Forum. The Customs Forum is to represent and help members of the CILT involved in anything to do with international trade, customs work, because we have lots of forums for different things, because the CILT covers passenger transport as well as international goods movements and international trade. So we have these separate forums. We're mostly online. Uh, we don't really meet up because everyone's too busy to do that. Mm -hmm. But we have uh, where you can ask questions and you'll get me to answer them. Or and you want Susan, believe me. <laughs> I'll try anyway to answer most of them. Uh, and we you know, people can talk amongst themselves on a LinkedIn forum uh, and ask questions, answer each other, or, or get me intervening. <laughs> with what's going on. And we also put news for customs things out on that as well. Brilliant, thank you. And just to prove that point again, um, Susan, you've been around in the customs area for quite a while, is that fair to say? A bit more uh, of your background? That's very fair to say. Um, I've always been in the international goods movement always. field. Always, always, always. Goodness me. Not working for customs directly, but working for traders, importers and exporters and freight agents who are uh, all engaged in moving goods around the world. So from when I left school, I've been doing moving goods around the world. So what sort of goods? Big goods, little goods? Everything. Everything. Pretty much everything. You can probably say by now I've moved pretty much everything to anywhere. Goodness. And back again. Wow. So <laughs> what you don't know about moving things around the world is not worth knowing. Well, you can <laughs> never know everything because people keep changing the rules on you. Brexit's just another example of that. Wow. We've just finished another one of these sessions uh, in the last half an hour, and I'm looking for a question from the audience that will stump Susan, I've yet, to, I've yet to hear it. So please, a complex question, something around the context of your product area, uh, your trade body, or something around, I'm keen to stump Susan. You've Thank yet you. To, you've yet to be stumped by the sound <laughs> of it. You're also gonna hear or see a lot of links in that text chat box. So if you've not found the text chat box to ask your question, please do so. Uh, and as Susan's talking about where to go to for more information, you'll see information appearing in there, usually a long link and it's worth following those links. Feel free to follow them during this session. It may then stimulate more questions, which you can then put to um, Susan. So um, what are we talking about then in terms of customs impact post-Brexit? Where do we even start that conversation? Well, I think we start with saying that whether we get a deal or whether we get a no deal, and we're not gonna talk politics here, we're talking the practicalities, not the politics of the situation. Whether we have a deal or a no deal, for customs purposes, it doesn't actually make much difference, if anything. Really? Because the procedures you're going to have to follow, because we have left, it's not the how we leave, mm. it's because we've left, will all be the same, uh, regardless. So whether you have a deal, a no deal, a free trade agreement, doesn't really make much difference in the customs world. So we're going to start with talking about what sort of customs work we're going to have to do, what we face, and how we progress that. Okay. for I mean, preparedness for Brexit. So in terms of political questions, you're not interested in that? You can't really comment on the politics? The politicians will do what the politicians will do. Um, we are in CILT, we're in a practical mode for s dealing with whatever they do, however they do it, what do we have to do as the people on the ground moving the goods? There you go, so practical questions, please send them to us in that text chat panel. Of course, there's a question already, can you believe it? Can we have a question? You we okay can, for that? of course. <laughs> uh, hi, Susan. I've been told today that NCTS, not sure what that is, but you do, NCTS is not going to be available to us post-Brexit. Is this true? 
How can we do transit without NCTS? You've got to explain what NCTS is. Yeah. NCTS is the National Computerised Transit System, or the new Computerised Transit System. It's not new. It's been around a long time now. But we will still have uh, availability of that because um, we're going to talk about transit a bit later on in the webinar. But uh, we're members of the Common Transit Agreement, and we still will be post-Brexit, so we will still have access to NCTS. Wow. So, David, thank you for that question, really early question. Mm -hmm. uh, I barely understood it, but Susan clearly did. Hopefully that gives you some idea of, of uh, Susan's knowledge there. So please keep those sorts of questions coming. So over to you. Okay, so moving on. One of the things that the government has been particularly impressing upon people for post-Brexit is that you should have what's called an EORI number, which is the Economic Operator Registration Identification Number. But that's way too long a title to keep <laughs> saying. I love Eori because it reminds me of Winnie the Pooh. Yes, Eor. Yes, Eori is what we shorten it to as the acronym. And Customs is full of acronyms because it's full of long, silly names. So the acronyms are easier. Now this is just a registration number that identifies the importers and the exporters in the process, so we know who they are. So it's a company uh, registration, but an individual can have one as well. It's, it doesn't have to be just companies. And that would start with GB. Always GB. Always GB if it's a UK, um, which is another silliness, but it's, it's always going to start GB if it's a UK-issued EORI. Now, what has come up, that's easy. You can get it online. That's it easy. takes 10 minutes. It's free. It's really not a bother, but you must have one if you import an export. So this is the moment to go online and Check. grab yourself one. If How you would you know if you've one. not got one? your products would have that well, next no, to it. No, no, your company should know. Somebody yeah. in your company would know if you've got one. If you haven't, then this is the moment to acquire one. Okay. So it's a 10-minute process, not a problem to do, but you have to have one post-Brexit. So the first thing you should do is check that. But then what caused much confusion when customers put this out is that they said, and sometimes you might need to have an EU one as well. And people were perplexed about that, and why would we need to have an EU one too? Well, the reasoning here is, if you currently trade with Europe, perhaps you don't just send the goods, perhaps you do some customs work in the EU. Now, customs work at the moment in the EU involves a thing called an intrastat, an EU sales list, and some boxes on the VAT return, if you're VAT registered. And an intrastat's really like a cut-down customs entry but it's done in arrears it, slightly differently for Europe. It's not a transactional thing, it's a monthly thing. So that's sort of customs work. But if you do any kind of customs work in your own company's name, so your British company's name or your UK company's name, but you do it in a European country, then that's when you're going to need post-Brexit to have an EU number as well. And you can get one, let's say, in France, and that would cover you for the whole of the 27 member states. You don't need to get 27 EORIs, just one. one would do for the whole 27 member states. So we're thinking about what do you do today and how does that translate post-Brexit into doing customs work in a different way, mm -hmm. customs declarations, and that's when you'd need an EORI. Now that leads us on to how is that described in any, that responsibility, in any document of sale or purchase or any sort of transactional paperwork that you might have. And in international trade, that's usually by using an INCO term, an international contract term. Inco. They're published by the International Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And there's a new set, coincidentally, to start on the 1st of January 2020. Excellent timing. <laughs> Uh, so, at the currently we use 2010's version, it'll be 2020's version from the 1st of January. So, you, you need to look at your documents, your sales orders, your purchase orders, the small print on the back, and see what you reference for INCO terms, because you may need to be changing that between now and January, so that you're using the right set with the right information. Now, an INCO term is an abbreviation. It's a shorthand for pages of contact contract information that says who does what. So who's responsible for what, whose risk is what, who's paying for what in our supply chains. Because there's lots of elements in a supply chain. There's the original trader who's sending or selling goods, there's the haulier, there's a freight agent, you know, there's lots of people involved. 
So who's doing what, who's responsible for organising what, and who's taking the risk for that part of the journey? So you can tell by the INCO term if you are actually offering to do any customs work in the destination country, so in Europe at the moment. And if you are, that's the need for the EU EORI number. And you'd have to then think, who is doing that work? Because if your company is registered in the UK, that's fine, you can have a UK EORI. But if you're doing customs work in France post-Brexit, this can lead us to say, well, actually, you need to register a company in France. And it would be that registered company that got the EORI. Just for France or the whole 27 countries? Uh, that would cover you for the 27, but we use France as an example. Yes. Uh, you wouldn't have to set a company up necessarily in Germany, France and, and everywhere else, so long as it became an EU of some sort mm -hmm. company. But companies, of obviously that's long term, you can't set a company up in 10 minutes. So, and it's also strategic and a corporate issue because there's tax issues of all sorts around this. So you've got to think about, is that what you want to be doing? So you might be doing it today because, to be fair, within Europe, there aren't that many checks and you can fudge things a little bit, intentionally or not. You can fudge what's going on. So you might be doing some customs work or be meant to be doing some <laughs> customs work uh, right now. And maybe you aren't and maybe you are. And we're all in Europe, so it happens. And nobody really comes down on you unless you're absolutely unlucky. Uh, but when we Brexit, it won't be invisible anymore. It's going to be a hard border. Actual, real customs work will be done and the goods won't move unless it is. So this is going to matter hugely post-Brexit. Brilliant. Those of you just joined late, uh, welcome to the CILT Brexit Awareness Training Session on the customs impact post-Brexit. So please welcome, welcome to the session. And if you have a question and we'd like to hear your questions, please post them into the text chat panel on, at the bottom of the screen and Susan will come around to those. There's yet to be a question that I've seen Susan not being able to answer. And there's one already from David, so thank you very much indeed for that. So uh, there's also a link also to purchasing the new Inco term book, um, mm -hmm. a link. So you can purchase the book. You can book the book of rules, yes. The book you of rules. You can purchase wow. it from the ICC. Yes. Keep an eye on that text chat panel for those links. Some of them I'm thinking you'll want to have found before. And some of these mm -hmm. things take a bit of digging into, and we've done, the CILT have done that digging for you. Yes. More on that story later. Okay, <laughs> so that's if you're VAT registered. If you're not VAT registered today, and you don't need to be, then you're not doing any kind of customs work, intrastats or EU sales lists or anything like that, because you're not VAT registered. And you don't need to be, that's correct. But when we Brexit, you are going to t have to now take part in customs work, even though you're not VAT registered. So you're going to have to get involved in customs declarations and gather some new information. Those who are VAT registered will already have been gathering that information, because of doing the interest stats, or most of it anyway. But those who are not VAT registered may well not have been retaining the information that is needful. So that's going to mean more work of a sort. Not that hard, because you should know most of it about your product and your shipment. You'd think so. Already. But you've got to assemble it in the right order and pass it on in the appropriate manner. Uh, that has to be done if you're non-VAT registered post-Brexit. Mm -hmm. The other big thing about um, import and export post-Brexit is that import duty and VAT will become payable on arrival. So that's at the time of arrival in the destination country. You have to pay the duties and taxes, otherwise the goods don't move out of the port. At the port? Yes. Right. That's the idea. It has to be paid before the goods are released for their onward movement. Uh, import duty is based on a tariff code and a tariff code is simply a number which represents the product. So it, every country has a tariff listing and you'd have to find your product and find its correct number. Where do you begin that process of finding your, your code? You can go online in the UK and uh, Google it, online simple tariff as code. Simple as that. Yes, it's free. And then you can find lots of useful information and all the tariff codes. So you can make your start there. That's a good place to start, mm -hmm. to look up your tariff code. And next to the tariff code would be the rate of import duty. And currently the rate you see is the one for Europe, because we're in Europe. So you're going to look at that and see the rate. That rate will remain for Europe after Brexit. So if you're importing into France, then the tariff, tariff duty rate you can see today will apply. 
that's not going to change. They're not going to change post Brexit for going into the EU. That's good. But you can also look up now the UK's own tariff listing for post Brexit. Because once we leave the EU, we're allowed to invent, if you like, our own listing with our own duty rates. Invent? That sounds creative. <laughs> well, it could be creative. Wow. It's often strategic, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it could be. And that can be found online today, so there need be no doubt as to what duty would be paid for goods coming into the UK post-Brexit. We have that already listed out for us by the government, again, freely available online. And you can look up there what your rate would be. But what we have done in the UK post-Brexit is say over 85% of the goods on the list, we've put the duty rate to zero. Not everything, but a large quantity of goods coming into the UK are zero rated. Why so many? Why 85%? Then? To ease trade through. Gosh. To help everyone move goods post-Brexit. Very generous. And make it less costly and less, less onerous, if is you like. Is there rhyme or reason as to why it's 80, that 85%? Is it obvious as to why Well, the usually the tariffs are set to protect industry. So a, a high tariff would be to protect your local industry. And a low tariff means either you don't have an industry to protect in that area or it doesn't much matter, it's not going to hurt them. Um, that's really why you strategically set your tariffs the way they are. And of course, people talk about with tariffs the WTO, the World mm -hmm. Trade Organization rules and how they're going to change things. Well, actually today, when we trade outside of the EU, so sending goods to America or receiving goods from Australia, that is on WTO rules. They're completely understood. They're what we use today. They're not a surprise and mm. they're not particularly a nuisance. Uh, that's normal trade rules. I'm assuming the audience will know all about that WTO, WTO rules, I'm well, assuming. They may do. It just means we have tariff codes, we have tariffs that are agreed, we have rules of fair trade, if you like. Um, they are rules of engagement that set a fair way of doing things, a level playing field to an extent across the world for all members of the World Trade Organization. There's a tariff post uh, UK Brexit tariff law and uh, tariff uh, link on the text chat. So please follow that text chat panel if you've not found it already. And just a reminder, we would love your questions. So please, please pose your contextual questions. They can be quite detailed questions uh, to us and we'll have Susan answer those. And we found that some companies have been worrying a great deal about their Brexit preparedness because they think that the tariffs are coming in and they're going to be very stringent and difficult. And when you point out to them the temporary new tariff, it's going to last for six months, if not a lot longer. They're going to review it in six months to see how it's going uh, online. And when we look at that, their product is zero. And they, they suddenly say, oh, well, all that we thought we were going to have to fuss and worry about, actually, there's nothing to think about. It's actually better than it is today because we import today and we have to pay 2-3% duty and post-Brexit will be zero. So that's a, a good thing. So don't worry unnecessarily, but I guess be prepared. Check it out and be prepared, yes. Don't be ignorant of what's going on. Find out the reality and then use it in your preparations is what we would want to say. Oh, went too far. So we're going to talk now about procedures that you can do through customs which would mitigate any duty you had to pay. So help you over that issue, if you like, of duty that is to be paid. And these are procedures that can be used today. So they're available today. We know how they work. We've been using them for years uh, as they are. So it's not a surprise to us or anything new. And we use them outside of Europe with trade with the rest of the world. When you say mitigate, you mean avoid? Avoid, legally avoid uh, the duty that would be chargeable. These are all legit? These methods you're going to be talking about now? All, are all absolutely legit, yes. They're wow. in the customs law today and will be in UK law. It's already been um, put through the government. It's not one of the ones they're arguing about. This has already gone through Parliament and been signed off by the Queen. So by mitigating these, you're just saving yourself money, I'm assuming. And you hassle? are. It is an opportunity to save money, yes. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Well, it's quid pro quo, a little bit of bureaucracy goes with these. Ah. So that's saving money, but you've got to do a bit of extra bureaucracy is, is really the way it works. Now, the first one we're looking at is Inward Processing Relief. That's its title, known as IP. And Inward Processing Relief is for imports, and it will apply to imports from the European 27 countries post-Brexit, as well as to the rest of the world imports, which it applies to today. And for this, they say, when you import, you don't have to pay the duties and taxes that are officially chargeable. They are suspended. 
For, for how long? Well, that depends what you do next. <laughs> if you then, you, the inward processing is, as its title says, you're bringing them in in order to do something to them. Now, what you do could be as simple as taking something in bulk and bagging it into something smaller, or sticking new labels on things, or it could be bringing in sugar to make biscuits. Whatever your process is, pretty much all processing is permitted under inward processing relief to almost, well, I haven't yet found any goods it isn't permitted for, so pretty much all goods and all types of processing. So you've not paid your duties and taxes, you bring your goods in, you do to them whatever it was you intended to do to them, and then you have three choices. The first one is you could choose to re-export those goods you've made, so send them out of the UK post-Brexit to anywhere in the world, including Europe. Europe. And if you do that, you don't ever have to pay the duties and taxes. Did you say ever? Ever. Ever. It's wiped out. It's gone. So the import duty and tax, if you like, you should have paid. Because you're using this procedure, it's gone wow. if you re-export the goods that you make from whatever you import. You could choose, however, to say, I want to import them now to the UK. I've done my processing. I want to import them into the UK. And that would mean you do have to pay duties and taxes at that point. So if you like, this is a delaying mechanism in that circumstance, because however long your processing took, you haven't had to pay the money. And then you would have to pay duties and taxes when you took them out. However long that processing takes? Yes, you have to tell customs when you get authorised to do this, the average sort of time you expect. We're talking months? Yeah. Really? You know, whatever, you have to justify how long you want. So that's what you put down, and if they think it's reasonable, it's what you get. Mm -hmm. you know, it depends on your process. If it's sticking a label on a box, not so long. You know, if it's making something bigger, much longer. Whatever is appropriate. So that's a delaying mechanism. And the third choice is to move the goods then into another special procedure. And we'll talk about that a bit more when we've talked about some other procedures mm -hmm. that you might move them into. So you have the three options at the end of your processing. Now, IP is a very large and beneficial um, procedure, and that we've just talked about the sort of simplistic side of it. But actually, when you have your choice to import them, if that's your choice, to the UK, and you've got to pay the duties and taxes, there is another level that you can go to, which is you can consider, let's say you imported sugar, well, there would be a tariff code for sugar, and there would be a duty rate for sugar. But you've made biscuits and there's a tariff code for a biscuit and a duty rate for a biscuit. And you can look at the two, and if, let's say, sugar was 2% and biscuits were 10%, you can choose to use the one for the 2%. Wow. So the duty would only be payable at 2%. That's good. It is. It is. And you can do it the other way around. If, if what you imported sugar was 10%, but biscuits were 2%, you could say, I'd rather use the tariff code for biscuits, thank you. That sounds too good to be true. But it is legal, in the law, and perfectly allowable. But you've got to know that you can do but it. But you've got to know you can do it, yes. Yeah. You've got to understand the rules and, and apply them to what you're doing. So it's got a lot more detail in it if you go deeper. It's also very facilitative to manufacturers because you can do something called equivalence, which is just another silly title. <laughs> But it's another name for, let's say you've got some stock that was duty paid and some that was not in your processing mm -hmm. you're going through. And for some reason you wanted to do a big re-export order and you didn't have enough of the not duty paid stock to you send out. You balance it out somehow. You balance it out. You borrow it. It's like sort of swapsies. <laughs> you, you borrow the duty paid stock and use it for export. And when your next load comes in of sugar, you simply designate it as if it was the not duty paid stock. That sounds very fair. It, 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 you just can swap it over. That we call equivalence in sim simplistic terms. So you can do that. You can even export before you import. So if you've got lots of biscuits and you want to export them, but then you want to bring some more sugar in, you, you're kind of doing it backwards. Mm. You've made a product first, but now you want to supply more. So you can meet a huge export order, if you like, and then bring the sugar in afterwards to make more biscuits, but swap them over. So you're actually then 
Again, it's another sort of swapsies, but, uh, but you're doing the export before the import. So that could apply to just-in-time manufacturers, car manufacturers, let's say, that are bringing in com car components? Yeah, anybody, yes. Any, any item. Not just biscuit and makers, any is anybody. No, no, any item. Wow. I just use biscuits as a, an example. But anything, yes, at all, would, would be f absolutely uh, allowable in inward processing relief. Now, its close cousin is outward processing relief. And as the name implies, mm -hmm. you're going out first, yeah. you're exporting first. But there aren't any duties on export, so how is this beneficial? Well, if you imagine perhaps you've made some fabric in the UK and you want to send it to a factory abroad, anywhere in the world post-Brexit, and they're going to turn it into suits for you. So they make their suits and then comes the import when the suits come home. Now, what OP allows you to do is when the suits come home, you only pay duties and taxes on the added value that occurred when they were away. So not on the value of the cloth, which is probably the biggest item mm. in the value build of the suit, but actually on the sewing together and cutting up service. The manufacturing service. The manufacturing suit. service that was provided to you abroad. Works for repairs as well. So you could send something out to be repaired. When it comes back, you only pay duties and taxes on the cost of the repair, not on the item itself. So this mitigates a large amount of the duty that might be payable by reducing the figure on which you have to pay it, I if you see what I mean. If your item was repaired under warranty, so there's no repair cost, you don't pay any duties and taxes at all. Any questions, please let us know. I think I understood what you just said there, but I'm okay. sure everyone here in the audience does get it. If you don't, please let us know. So that's the first two, the processing procedures. Inward, outward. Inward, outward. The next big one to discuss is customs warehousing. Some people know this as bonded warehousing, but that's a name that's not really in the law. They're actually called customs warehouses, but somewhere in the psyche we've got bonded stuck from years ago. Um, but they're customs warehouses. Now, these don't have to be the giant shed that you see along the way. They can be a cage, a tank, a silo, a cupboard, a small room, a part of a warehouse. Volume's not an issue. Volume's not an issue. It could be tiny. Tiny. I once ran one that was a shelf in a safe. A single shelf. Yes, that was diamonds. Wow. Didn't need much room for those. No. no. <laughs> so it, the size doesn't matter in that respect at all. It's not to do with the size of the area, just that it's designated a customs warehouse. The warehouse is mis misleading, I suppose, because it implies a big space, but it can be any. Yes, it okay. can be any. In customs terms, it doesn't mean the big shed. It could be any area at all. And what happens here is you import the goods to the customs warehouse and you don't pay imports duty and VAT. Question on that though. Yes. Is it permitted, thank you for the question, is it permitted to sell goods which are in a customs warehouse if the new owner would want them to remain in the customs warehouse? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, so we'll explain that a bit more, but we'll just talk about how we take out the goods first. Okay. So you bring them in, no duties and taxes. They can stay in the warehouse, sold or not, forever. For as long as you want them to, there is no time limit. Now, if you're using what's called a public customs warehouse, that's where you rent space in one that's available to lots of people to use as a customs warehouse, you'll be paying rent. So you might not want them to stay there forever. Mm. But if you've got your own warehouse yourself, well, that's up to you, isn't it? It's your own cost of keeping the warehouse. I guess one day it might be over full, but you can control that. You can leave them there. There's no customs reason for taking them out. What can you do with them once they're in there? You're allowed with storage principally. Only storage. But you are allowed to do small tasks. We call that usual forms of handling. As I said, we have to have silly names for everything <laughs> in customs. That's usual forms of handling. It means you can uh, test them, you can repackage them, you could relabel them, you could put from bulk to small things, you know, that sort of work, minor works, not actually processing the goods in any way because that belongs under IP and OP. But to the last question, you could sell them from the customer But you can warehouse. sell them whilst they're there, if they stay there. Selling from what, you know, changing ownership of the goods within the warehouse is entirely permitted and happens quite a lot with commodities. Uh, it's not a problem, that's fine. What you're not allowed to do is sell them to the public at a trade counter in the warehouse or to let the, let the public, if, as it were, into the warehouse right. to buy the goods. 
that is absolutely forbidden. But there are circumstances when you can sell them, not just to stay in the warehouse, as we spoke of in answer to that question, but you could sell them to an airside shop. Now that would be what we call duty-free shops, which are of course customs warehouses by a different name. That's why you don't pay the duties and taxes, they because, just look you're nice. because you're re-exporting, but you do let the public in those right. because they're airside. Right. But you could sell to them and that counts as an export, so you don't ever pay the duties and taxes. You could sell to um, organisations such as NATO or the UN, or a consulate or an embassy. So maybe you made a sale from your warehouse to the American embassy in London and your warehouse could be in London. That still counts as an export because the embassy of course is American soil. So you've made an export, no duties and taxes will ever be paid. They're forgotten and forgiven. Uh -huh. um, something that's come along in May 2016, which was a game changer for customs warehousing, is that you are allowed to do remote retail sales. Now, what does that mean? Online sales? Online, or? internet, phone. Right. Anything that doesn't involve the company or the person turning up at the warehouse, because that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do that, what normally happens with such a purchase is the person buying it pays for the goods as they place their order. If you do an internet order for things, mm -hmm. you normally pay up when you make the order. That means, of course, when you then take the goods out to fulfil that order from the warehouse, duty and VAT become payable because that could be a sale to the UK. They would become payable. But, of course, you've had the money first. You've had the customer pay the money before you've had to pay any money to customs. How's that for a, custom, uh, a benefit for cash flow? I mean, why would you not? It sounds good to me. Why would you There's not? There's no catch there. No, none at all. Now, if you think about big companies who might have an RDC, a regional um, distribution centre, or a big warehouse for their goods somewhere, why would you not have it designated a customs warehouse? So you didn't pay duties and taxes for the goods as they came in from abroad, and you didn't have to pay the duty and tax until a customer bought them, and you already had their money. Is it conceivable that some people might have a warehousing but not designate it as a customs warehouse and be losing that benefit? Indeed it is, yes. Because wow. if you import things, you would pay the duties and taxes into an ordinary warehouse. But if you put them in the customs warehouse, you don't. So this last option for sale has really generated a boom in customs warehousing now. Now, it's to companies' competitive advantage, so you're not going to find out easily who's got one. Because, of course, they're, they're making cash flow gains on this, and they don't want their competitors to know, because they'd rather stay ahead of the game. <laughs> um, but th it's open to anyone who can apply for a customs warehouse. And presumably we're not talking about stockpiling in a warehouse. That's nothing to do with it. Well, that's been done as well. Because, of course, you can use a warehouse for stockpiling. If you wanted to stockpile pre-Brexit and your goods are coming from outside of Europe, why not put them in a customs warehouse where you're not going to pay duties and taxes? Seems the obvious place. Until you've made the decision at the end of the warehousing when you want to take them out, am I going to re-export? never pay the duty? Am I going to import to the UK, do pay the duty? Or am I going to put them in another procedure? Now, we've, we've got enough procedures now to talk about that, <laughs> the daisy chaining, of the, as we call it, of these procedures. Imagine if you put some goods into the customs warehouse and they sat there for a while, your stock. Then you decided you were ready to work on them, to do some processing. Well, if you were authorised, you moved them from the customs warehouse, no duty and tax paid, into inward processing, still don't pay any duties and taxes. Process them in whatever way it was you, you wanted and then put them back in the warehouse as stock of the finished item, no duties and taxes paid. Only when you're then ready to fulfil an export order or a local order do you have to pay any money. It's not a fudge then, this is real. It's not a fudge, this is real. This is legal and entirely possible oh. and some people are very, very good at it. <laughs> And you're saving yourselves money, you're saving yourself the bureaucracy by doing this, by daisy-chaining these things yes. together? Yes. There is some bureaucracy to do. There's a lot of track and trace. Mm -hmm. You can't let goods wander off. <laughs> They've got to be traced through the process. But it's saving you a lot of money. At, at worst, it's a delaying mechanism, so you don't have to pay so much, so often or so early. Uh, and at best, you may never have to pay. So why would you not do this? 
So we see a lot of this use of these procedures joined together and daisy chained um, to allow companies to get those benefits. Question, and thank you for your questions. If I put products into a customer's warehouse prior to Brexit and remove them post Brexit, will they be subject to the new temporary UK tariff when I take them out? So if, if assuming these have come in from outside of Europe into the customer's warehouse to start so. with, uh, then there was a duty suspended when they came in, and that is the duty that will live with them. So as you begin, you finish. This is what's being said about the Brexit laws. If you start under what is today EU law, you finish it under EU mm -hmm. law um, uh, within a certain time limit, at least six months to a year. It would be you finish it under e EU law. You can't swap. Right. Hopefully that's answered your question. Please let us know if that wasn't quite what we understood there, but uh, thank you for your question. It's a yes, so it's a big thumbs up. Thank you. Yes. So we now move to another procedure, and this is one of the most eclectic little procedures. <laughs> it's called end use. And this is the only one that's going to change its name post-Brexit. In the UK, we're going to call this authorised use. <laughs> Just when you're getting used to calling it one thing, you're <laughs> yes. calling it something else. It's becoming authorised. Some people have suggested end use could be abbreviated to EU, so perhaps that's why mm. they're changing it. Mm -hmm. But we don't know that for sure. We don't really know. But end use is becoming authorised use post-Brexit. Now, this is another procedure that says you do not pay the duties and taxes as you import the goods. And there are certain designated goods for this one. The first one is aircraft and aircraft parts. Now, if you import anything like that, let's say you're in s you are a company who installs seats on aircraft, you import your seat, you do not pay duties and taxes, you then fix the seat to a given aircraft, and you record in your commercial records what you have done, so which aircraft you fixed it to and when. But you've got to be the seat fixer. You've got to be you the seat fixer. You can't outsource that to no. someone else. You've got to be the seat fixer. Right. And once you've done that, that's the end of it. No duties and taxes ever that paid. That sounds too good to be true as well. It's an it's a excellent procedure, what more can I say? Right. And it's legal and perfectly acceptable and used a lot. But not just aircraft and aircraft parts, How, where else does that apply? Well, we start with aircraft and aircraft parts because that's a huge thing. If you think it could be anything from a fridge on the aircraft to a seat that's to true. an engine, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of aircraft parts that could be involved here. But you can also have ship work. And it's the same idea, but for commercial vessels, not military. You can't have military for any of this. So ships? Ships, yes. Not your local little yacht you might own yourself, but a commercial ship. So anything from a ferry to a cruise liner to any other kind of commercial ship serving an oil rig. And in fact, you can actually have oil rigs. So the food and drink on those? No, it mustn't be that sort of consumable. It's, it's got to be something, if you think about it, that's attached to the ship. You could have cutlery for the galley because it remains with the ship. Mm -hmm. You could have paint for the decking. You could have beds for the crew. You could have engines. You know, anything to do with the ship or constructing a ship or fitting out or repairing a ship, anything like that. It's the same idea as the aircraft, but for vessels, just not uh, sandwiches for the crew. That won't do. You can't have that for end use. So again, you bring it in, no duties and taxes, record in your records which ship you bolted it to, and then that's the end of it. No duties and taxes ever to be paid. Wow. You can also do it for three really eclectic uh, products, and that is um, fish, cheese, and prawns. <coughs> Imported for human consumption, but to be processed before you eat it uh, in an industrial scale. So if you were bringing in uh, fish to make fish pies for someone like a major retailer, so on a factory level production line, no duties and taxes paid, record which batch you put the fish in, that's it. But Never not for paid. sandwiches. But not well, it could be if it's for a major retailer, okay. that's an industrial level. But if it's your local sandwich shop, no, because right. that's not industrial enough. Wow. So we don't really know who chose the particular products. Prawns, cheese and... Prawns, cheese and fish. Mm. But <laughs> there you are. That's what's in the law. So that's end use or authorised use post-Brexit. So another very good procedure if you do those particular things. If anyone's online and uh, has, is doing that or not playing that game, I think it's not fair to say, <laughs> let us know. We want to hear how you're doing it and what benefits you get from doing that. It's entirely legitimate. There you go. Uh, you heard it here. Uh, the last one we're going to talk about is temporary admission. 
Now this one, as the name says, is for temporary import. So you bring your goods in, you do not pay duties and taxes. How long is temporary? Well, it depends on the product, but it could be up to 24 months. Doesn't sound too so temporary. So that's not that temporary. So maybe a machine for a hospital to use, special equipment. And they use it, and then it goes back. The key point is it must go back. It mustn't be upgraded or changed. It can be used, but it mustn't go back. Be maintained. It, 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 it can be maintained, but you can't upgrade it or change it or make right. it better. It must essentially be the same thing that's going back. Um, and there's all sorts of things you can put under temporary admission, uh, including uh, you know, tools of the trade or moulds or dyes or equipment to test things, things to be tested. You know, there's quite a large list of product. On that point, a question, can we import goods for testing to destruction under the temporary admission procedure? Because presumably if it's to destruction, you can't send it back. That is the problem. That's and the a answer good to that is no, because it's not going back. You can't send a mangled thing back. <laughs> well, if, if it was just a bit bent, probably. If it's in a thousand pieces on the floor and you had to sweep it up, <laughs> uh, no, because <laughs> it's no longer recognisably the thing. So if it's to be tested to destruction, usually the answer is no. But if that's if you know that when you bring it in. If it comes in for testing, and unfortunately during the testing it breaks and falls apart into a thousand pieces on the floor, then you have to settle up your temporary admission by paying the duties and taxes. Because you didn't because foresee that it was because going to do No, because you couldn't foresee that it was going to be tested to destruction. Right. Um, but if you know that before you import it, you can't use temporary what admission. What a great question, thank you. I've never thought about that. Or TA, as it's known. Now, one of the key features of doing these procedures is you must be authorised by customs to do them. They have to check you out. They're not going to trust anybody to do this efficiently and correctly. They have to look that you know what you're about. And part of that is saying, have you got enough money to pay the duties and taxes that are suspended should they become payable? And they don't trust you to have enough money. You're commercial, you know. They, they think there's a chance that you might not. So what they do then is say you must give a third party guarantee. Someone who will pay up if you haven't got the money. Who's that? Usually your bank or someone like that. And now when you go to the bank for a guarantee, of course that costs you money to get the guarantee. So it's a little expense. But for no deal, not for if there's a deal, but if for no deal, they have said, you don't need a guarantee. We'll waive the guarantee for these procedures. So you're forgiven getting a guarantee. So that expense has gone. That extra bureaucracy has gone if there is a no deal. How long would it take to get that guarantee? Is it a lengthy process? It can take 120 days or more. Which is a lot. Which is a lot, yes. So that's a very good thing and a large piece of bureaucracy that's actually been taken away. So it makes these procedures even more attractive for people to use. There's a link just gone up onto the text chat on easements for no deal guarantees. So please follow that link if that interests you. Mm. So yeah. uh, you've pretty much done that. So what are we looking at now? No well deal Well, now easement. we're looking at more easements. Easement. So the guarantee was an easement, no, not needing the guarantee. Now we're going to look at other easements, but only for no deal. Right. And this is, so if, there's not, if there is a deal, this goes away. Right. You can't have this. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> if we have a no deal, They've put something new in called Transitional Simplified Procedures, TSP. And they've been pushing that a lot for companies who've never traded outside of Europe, so beginners, if you like, to customs work. Mm -hmm. And TSP helps you out by saying that if you've got ordinary goods, that means goods that don't need particular paperwork, like uh, not like food, not like animals, live animals. Not diamonds, like you mentioned earlier. Uh, diamonds would be fine, but really? not like... Um, uh, perhaps the alligator handbag that mm. I also once had to ship mm. lots of uh, because that's under endangered species le legislation mm. so you need special papers for that. So they're what we call controlled goods. But for standard goods, anything that doesn't need special documentation, you're going to be allowed to import those goods without any customs paperwork but only if they're coming from the EU. Anywhere in the EU? Anywhere in the 27 member states post-Brexit, no deal, you can bring them in, do no customs paperwork at all, get your hands on your goods and do with them whatever it is you were intending to do. You can then have until the fourth day of the month following the importation. Very precise. Yes, you have to think that one through with a calendar. The fourth day of the month following import to submit your customs documentation which is due. 
and pay any duties and taxes that are due. But what they've said is for the first six months from the date of Brexit, when that, if that actually happened as a no deal, you don't need to submit that customs paperwork. Forget the fourth day of the month. You've got six months to get around to it. Now that sounds great, but if you think of a lot of people doing TSP and you then think they've got to submit their entry eventually at the end of six months, then what you're looking at is them going to a customs agent. That's the easiest way to get it done, to get a customs agent to do the entry for you. And think how many people would be asking for how many entries mm. to be done mm. across the country at the end of six months. There's a lot of freight agents going to be saying back, we don't have the resource to do that many within sort of 12 hours. So six months sounds good, but don't leave it till six months. But really, it's better to pace it. Right. Um, for you and for the freight agents, because after six months, are you going to remember what you imported? So it's, it is better to do it in a staged way. Maybe not the fourth day of the month following import. Maybe you want to take two months or three months to do that. But I wouldn't leave all of it to the last day of the six months. There's a question which has an acronym in it, so you've got to explain this. Um, we already use CFSP for the rest of the world imports. Should we transfer to TSP? in a no-deal situation. CFSP? Is Customs Freight Simplified Procedures. So should they switch to TSP in a no-deal situation? I would say no, because CFSP is the original procedure of which TSP is a cut-down version, a simplified version. If you've already gone to the trouble of doing CFSP, getting the authorizations, getting the guarantees, doing all of that, there's no real gain to stop doing all of that. Use TSP for six months mm. or a year and then mm. have to reinstate all of your CFSP work. It's much better to continue to use CFSP. Discuss that with your freight agent, and, and unless you are a freight agent, but discuss it with your freight agent because they have to have a guarantee for CFSP. And if you're going to put all of your European business through it as well, they might then need to enhance their guarantee. So there's no point really? There's really no point, no. I wouldn't okay. recommend dismantling something that's working well and is usable for the EU trade just to go with what is actually an easement that is temporary. And there's a couple of links there, one explaining uh, how to register for TSP and one uh, explaining what TSP is. So please follow those links. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> St sticky button. <laughs> um, so there's a tariff for that. Yes, there is. Another no-deal easement is that traders can apply. We've said how do you, you've got to pay duties and taxes. How do you do that? And it's normally by something called a deferment account. Because if you don't have a deferment account, you've got to rush down the port for every shipment and find someone to give cash to, or you've got to find someone to ring in HMRC to pay by credit card. If you can get to the port, that is, because they're going to be blocked. <laughs> well, I hope not, I hope but not. maybe. We hope not. But that's clearly not viable for multiple imports. And traders who do multiple imports use something called the deferment account. Now, this is a bank account. You would open and you allow customs to direct debit it on the 15th day of the month following import. Another precise date. Yes. Uh, for the duties and taxes for all the goods for the previous month. Um, and that uh, is very easy to do because then your goods just flow, you give the account number up and it's recorded on the customs declaration and the goods leave without anyone having to pay any money. So that makes things much faster and easier for everybody. So deferment accounts are a, a good thing generally. Do they check that the monies are in there or is it up to you to check? Is it's up to you to keep the money there, but again they don't believe that everybody always will, so they demand a guarantee. Mm. Just like we were speaking mm -hmm. about before, mm -hmm. they ask for a bank guarantee. Now, before you can do that, you have to get customs permission to do that. They have to evaluate you and see if you're, if you like, fit to get a bank guarantee and run a deferment account and, and look after it appropriately. And that's been taking 120 days. Wow. It's a lengthy customs uh, checkout, if you like, of your company. Now, that's a long, long time. Mm. So one of the easements is that in a no-deal situation, you can have a deferment, apply for the deferment account, but you won't have to get a guarantee. And they won't do all of the checking that they did before. Generous. So that means it's going to take a few days, not 120 days, and you don't have to go to the bank immediately. Uh, you will have to get one eventually, 
a guarantee, but it will be several months down the line that they'll suggest you need to go and get the guarantee. So if you like, on a no-deal situation, this is again going to be an easement, a speed to getting things through the ports, mm -hmm. rather than everyone having to go, oh, we need a bank guarantee and, <laughs> and take a long time to get one. Now, the other thing about that guarantee is that if you are, uh, you've got to pay normally VAT and duty at import. So the guarantee would cover duty and VAT. That's the point. It would all be taken at once from your account. Now, in a no-deal situation, if you are a VAT-registered company, then they will not take the VAT from the guarantee. You don't need a guarantee to cover the VAT portion. And as VAT is generally 20%, and duties are usually only one, two, three percent, something like that. There are some exceptions, but on average they're that level. Then the, uh, the largest proportion of your guarantee has always been the VAT element. So if you're VAT registered in a no deal situation, you do not need to include the VAT. Big saving on the guarantee. Mm -hmm. Because you are going to be allowed to do what's being called postponed VAT accounting. And that means all your import VAT you have to note it down on your VAT return that you as a VAT registered business would normally be doing. And so you simply take care of it on your VAT return. So no cash outflow at the time the goods cross the border or on the 15th of the month. If you do your VAT return monthly or quarterly, whatever date you do it, that's when you offset usually the VAT and you won't end up paying most of it. This mystical signing process, postponed VAT accounting is on the Text chat panel if you want to find out more about that one. Perfectly timed, thank you. Thank you. So that's an easement. I love the word easement. It's like making it easier, right? That's, well, that's the point. They're trying to make it easy. So the next thing we're going to move on to talking about is road haulage. Because there's been lots said in the press and by the government about what's known as the short straits crossing, which is going between Dover and Calais and other such southern coast ports mm -hmm. into Europe which is predominantly road haulage. Whereas airports and seaports in general, we don't really have a problem. They've been handling rest of world trade for years. Right. They know what they're doing. But when we come to these short straits ports, they mostly deal with Europe and have been running the European Union rules. So haven't really dealt with external trade before. And that makes a difference to them. And this is why we're a bit concerned because we need to do customs declarations, if, as we've said, both for the export and the import the other side. So how is all this going to work when you've got a very short crossing, mm. very little time to do all of it? Well, the idea here is that they've put online a Haulier's Handbook. They being, sorry, the Haulier? HMRC. Okay. Have put out a Haulier's Handbook, which is, I think, pretty good for one of HMRC's documents. Mm -hmm. And it explains, starting with what a driver would need. So what kind of passport? What kind of um, green card for insurance? That sort of thing would the driver need for Every going through? Every documentation they need. Yes, through He's certain countries, wherever they're driving to. Uh, Europe, Switzerland, Cyprus, places like that, there are differences. So it actually lays out what the driver would need mm -hmm. to be sure then that the driver has got that. Then it talks about what the vehicle would need. So the tractor unit, the trailer. Trailers will have to be registered and get a registration plate, for example and you need certain um, safety documentation to say the trailer and the tractor unit are suitable, that sort of thing. So it lays that out very clearly for anyone travelling to the EU post-Brexit. It also says in the handbook what you have to do with the goods and how you have to deal with that process. Now there's a part of the handbook which is called the pocket guide and you can drop another link into the pocket guide and that's a pictorial representation of what has to go on. Now the biggest change here to what we have today where you can just put the goods on a truck and it just goes is that there's a whole section of work that has to be done before the goods are ever loaded on the truck. Forget about approaching the port, it's before it even starts out on the journey to the port. Yes, before it even gets there, before it loads the goods at all. And part of that is the export declaration, so the customs export declaration and the import declaration at the other end have to be completed before the truck collects the goods. Now this means not 100% not completed because of course the truck hasn't crossed the border, but up to the point we call 
um, it's permission to progress, meaning you're good to go. Um, you have to get that done and both ends. So traders, not particularly the drivers, but the traders who are the exporters and importers have got to give evidence to the driver, which they will take with them, to prove that that work has been done. Because they won't be allowed on the ferry if they haven't got it. It's so as straightforward as that. They're, you're holding up everybody if you're, if you're not with that documentation. Yes. At the ports. Which won't be popular with anybody. <laughs> No, nobody, I nobody at all I is pleased so. about that. Um, so we have to be clear that there's quite a chunk of work to be done before the goods are collected. This is the big difference. But the handbook explains it quite well, and the pocket guide has a pictorial representation, which is very useful for people to understand. Do people need big pockets? Is it really a pocket guide? It's, it's quite simple. A uh, couple of pages of A4, oh. the pocket guide. You can fold it up. Pretty simple. That would be all right. Yes, it's not bad. We like pictures. The print, the, the explanatory print underneath it's a little small, <laughs> but uh, you're okay if you can, you've got reading glasses. <laughs> yes. Check the links. You'll see the links in the uh, text chat for more information on both of those. So lots to do before the goods are collected. We then have to think about what's going to happen with the goods. Are they going to go across the channel and are they going to remain in France? It's a French delivery. Or are actually we going across the channel to send them on to Germany or Poland and or And you would or know if you're, you're the consignee, you would know, or the kind of consignor, I should say, you would know where they're going. Yes, you should, well, uh, one would hope so. If you don't, of course, a customs warehouse would come in handy mm -hmm. uh, at the destination end. You heard this first. Yeah. Because you can put them there while you make your mind up. Uh, but let's say you know some of them are going through to other European countries and some are not. If they're going to France, then we're going to ha need that importer to do a French customs declaration before you put the goods up. If they're going through France to other places, then we're going to have to use a procedure known as transit. Now, transit was not a loved procedure. <laughs> we don't really like transit as it stands. And the reason for that is the, the vehicle has to go to checkpoints. It has to go to customs offices along the route to prove it's moving along the route, as was designated. Uh, and it appears that certain quantity of drivers find it very difficult to check in at the last checkpoint. In which case the company, usually the freight agent on the sending end, has had to have a guarantee in place, there's that guarantee again, against the fact that the duties and taxes will not be paid uh, because the driver didn't do the check-in properly what and just took them to where the delivery point. What guarantees involved here? Well, it, it's a guarantee to cover the duty, potential duties and taxes, so it can be quite large. And the transport companies or the freight agent, whoever's doing this transit guarantee, are always very concerned that their guarantees are getting eaten up by these ones where they've not gone to the office of destination first. And also, they get fined if that happens, and they have to do a lot of legwork to kind of mend it, because it didn't take place at the appropriate moment. And that's why it was never a loved procedure. <laughs> However, post-Brexit, the French are mandating that if the goods are not staying in France, you will use the transit procedure. You will. You will. So they don't want, you see, to have to deal with loads and loads of customs entries that really they feel should be done in Poland or Greece or somewhere. So they, they don't want that extra work. They've got quite enough trouble as it is. So that's why they've mandated this. How are they enforcing that? Uh, well, because we have to look at the paperwork that's being done, you see, which will have a destination address on it. So we can tell from the paperwork what you're up to. Now, if you're going for transit, that gets you an extra piece of paper. It's called a TAD, which is the Transit Administrative Document, accompanying document, sorry, Transit Accompanying Document. And it is a piece of paper which has to go with the goods. Now that has a barcode on it, and that barcode has a unique reference number known as the MRN, the Master Reference Number. And that uh, barcode will get scanned as they go on board the ferry, as they come off the ferry. You, know, you get your barcode scanned at all these customs offices along the way. So having an MRN is important. Now if you're a driver who has a multiple load for multiple shippers, on board, you might have multiple TADs and multiple MRNs. Now again, the French have said they can't be scanning all these loads and loads of MRNs for one truck. It's too slow, takes too much time, can't be doing it. 
So they're insisting that the driver goes to a system called the ProDuan app, which is an app for customs. A free app? A free app. And there you scan in each of your MRNs and it gives you what it calls an envelope. And that envelope has a single MRN and that is then linked to all the others and that is what gets scanned, the single one. So the driver does that before he sets out, can do that on the ferry? Where he does it before he boards. There will right. be scanning points, both for the train through the tunnel mm -hmm. and for the ferries. Mm -hmm. There are scanning points where that has to happen. So we must make sure, and they say, by the way, the TADs should be printed on green paper. Green. So that it's noticeable amongst batches of okay. paperwork. They should be green. Now, supposing your driver's got on the ferry, then there will be screens on the ferry, television screens where the driver's registration number for his vehicle or some other identifying item for the driver will be displayed as a list. And next to that, there will be um, a green spot or an orange spot or an orange spot with a hole in the middle. Green sounds good, orange sounds amber mm, kind of yes. good. What's the hole? Thing? Green is good for, you've got it all right, go through the designated lane when you get off the ferry, that means you just go. You're free to go. You're free to go, you're, you're good. Orange means you might have some of that special paperwork. So that might be a CITES permit for my alligator handbag, mm. which needs a stamp. So you do have to go into a channel then where, pe where people who have documents to be stamped. So that'll be a little slower. But straightforward. Straightforward, but slower. If you've got one with a hole in the Eek. middle, uh, that go down that lane and an <laughs> officer will be speaking with you. Mm. And whatever they think is amiss will be dealt with. Uh, that's the not so great channel. But the whole idea is a sort of triage. And triage is a good way of explaining it. A question, uh, thank you for this. Uh, if goods perish in transit due to port delays because of no deal, how would this impact the consignor and the consignee li liabilities? Who's liable? That depends on your INCO terms. Oh, we heard about INCO terms earlier on. Because that says who in the supply chain is responsible and has the risk for which portion of the supply chain. And it's the INCO terms 2020, not 2010. And it will, well, it will be 2020 from the 1st of January. If it happens in the end of October and you're shipping in November, then it's going to be the 2010 set. So if the, the goods perish in transit, then who's... Whoever's designated as liable by the INCO term in your deal is the liable party. Wow. You heard that here first. Um, and it, the delays, you see, things are being set up for exports from the UK, so there shouldn't be any delays because all of the work is being done before we get to the, if you like, the delay point before the goods are picked up. Mm -hmm. So if we do that properly, then the goods just flow. You get the green spot on the ferry and off you go. So we shouldn't have anything perish in transit. There you go. If we don't get it right, of course, that's when the problems start. Uh, and that brings me to the pop-up offices that customs are going to provide. Pop-up. Pop-up okay. offices. <laughs> Think porter cabin. And they're going to put them on service stations on the UK motorways. Across the whole country? Across the whole country. Not every service station, over 100, but not necessarily every single one, but on the main routes that vehicles would be using. And they're going to put them in the car parks where, the, well, not the car parks, the lorry parks, mm. where the drivers naturally will stop. Staffed by who? By Staffed by some customs officers and other agency staff with proper information. And the idea there is we're not going to infringe on driver's hours, but it's hoped that while the driver makes a natural stop, shall we call it, uh, for a drink or whatever, or a rest, they can spare five minutes to pop in to one of these pop-up offices and they can have a look through the paperwork that they have got and see if it's wanting in any way. Now that would prevent perhaps many miles of travel to fi before finding that out uh, and may, it may mean to save time. Some of these pop-up offices will be have, have full customs officers in them and will be able to print. Now why that's important is, say a document is missing, perhaps the haulier can report that back through his to his boss or her boss and that will go back to the trader and the trader might be able to email the missing document and they can print it out there to the popping off pop up office. They can print it out there and then that sounds good. and you might have saved the driver having to drive all the way back, let's say to Aberdeen or somewhere, to go and get the document. So it's going to save a lot of time and trouble, is the hope, uh, by bringing these in. This is only in the event of a no deal, though, that we have the pop-up offices. And some of them will be able to serve as the office of departure for our transit. So there'll be a lot more offices of departure, if you like, 
uh, along the natural trade routes oh. uh, for the drivers to go to. So that is a, a useful easement, it's a useful help in this uh, eventuality. Now I mentioned the ProDuan app that the French have put in. The Dutch have also put in a customs, um, proceed, a customs system, but it's not an app, it's actually a system uh, which you can get access to. You have free to get system. credentials, but it's not free. What? No, the French isn't. The uh, French is free, but the Dutch is not. How much are we talking? I uh, don't quite know yet, right. but it is said to have a fee, and it's mandatory. Wow! If you're going to a Dutch port, so more needs to be said about that and investigated. The Hawley's Handbook has, has has details as far as we know them at this point, so that's useful to know. Hawley's Handbook link is in the uh, text chat panel. Please uh, follow that link. Thank you. So then we come to the discussion of what about Northern Ireland? There's been much said about Northern Ireland, about the um, backstop, mm -hmm. which caused Mrs May's deal to be so disliked, uh, about the new withdrawal agreement that we now have proposed, where there is the suggestion that suddenly we have a border down the North Sea. But I mean, the whole point of any of this work is that between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, the land border, there should not be an actual border. Mm -hmm. There would be no customs work done. That is what has to be the case because of the Good Friday Agreement. So how do we cope with that when they are two different countries post-Brexit? Well, we, what we've done is we've said that from GB to Northern Ireland, then there will be only a small amount of information needed to be given to UK customs as the goods move, a sort of, we're moving this tiny message, not a proper declaration, and there'll be no import duty into Northern Ireland from the UK, from, from GB into Northern Ireland. So if you like a tiny bit of information and off you go, not a problem. Uh, if you're going Northern Ireland to GB, again, a small amount of information, slightly different data set because it's an export, mm -hmm. not an import mm -hmm. set of information, and no import duty into GB, again, off you go. I feel a catch coming on. Well, the catch is when we go to Northern Ireland, there is a risk that the goods are not staying in Northern Ireland. It might be known already, but there is a risk that they might not. They might go into the Republic of Ireland across the land mm -hmm. border. And that means they've entered the EU, they could go anywhere in the EU, but they've not paid any duties and taxes into the EU. So it's too late. Or done any proper customs paperwork. Indeed, it might be thought to be smuggling. Uh, and the EU could not do any checks to see if they were suitable to come into the EU either. You know, it would have happened and nobody had control over it. Now clearly to the EU this is not acceptable. You, you would see that that's reasonable in mm. a way. Mm. But the, how do you deal with that? Well the proposal in the new withdrawal agreement is you deal with it by having to designate when the goods leave GB, heading for Northern Ireland, whether or not they are intended to go into Europe or whether they're intended to stay in Northern Ireland. Not accidental, you have to know whether they were yeah, this is this is you know at this moment. Again, if you don't know, how about a customs warehouse in Northern Ireland mm. until you do know? Oh, there's an answer. Uh, but supposing you know, then what would happen is if it's going to stay in Northern Ireland, then no duties and taxes are payable. If it's going into the EU, the UK government would collect the European duties and taxes. As if it, uh, you know, when it gets to Northern Ireland, so somewhere in the North Sea, you know, in, in the midst of the crossing, that would be done as an import entry into Europe with the duties and taxes to be collected. Right. But the e UK government would do the collecting. Right. Now, that, of course, means what's going to happen to the tariff. We said we had a new UK mm. tariff which is probably going to be different rates to the EU tariff, lower rates. So what are we supposed to do? And think again that some of those goods crossing the sea could have come into the UK from outside of Europe and not paid their duties and taxes yet, but be moving through in a transit method, mm -hmm. you know, through the UK, through Northern Ireland and onward. So what are we supposed to do? Well, the idea here is that those goods might need to pay EU rates. So the default will be, if you don't know they're sticking in I Northern Ireland, pay the pay European the rate. rates and then reclaim it if they happen to stay in Northern Ireland. 
So that's the default that's going to be operated and is proposed in this new withdrawal deal. What we had while Mrs May's deal was being negotiated was the suggestion that trusted traders, more on that in a moment, but that trusted traders could say definitely my goods will stay in Northern Ireland and be trusted that that was true and therefore not pay the duties and taxes into Northern Ireland and everybody else would not be trusted and therefore have to pay the European duties as the goods went into Northern Ireland and if they stayed there would have to do the reclamation. So it brings in this concept of trusted trader. Now that's not in the withdrawal deal at the moment, but they haven't said in that deal what the mechanism would be. So we're speculating that it might be the same as was previously put forward, which was this trusted trader idea. Well, the obvious question is how do you get the trusted trader, trader status? Well... Trusted to do what? Um, we'll hold that thought for a <laughs> moment. We will say, but we have to speak f first about the free trade agreement that follows the withdrawal agreement, if we're following a sort of logical mm -hmm. agreement mm -hmm. sequence mm -hmm. here. So what about this free trade agreement with the EU that the government is suggesting they want at the moment, yet to be negotiated? Well, the thing about free trade agreements is they give you duty-free or reduced duty access to the market. So UK goods going into the EU wouldn't pay full EU rates, they might go in free, and vice versa. So it gets rid of this thing about there's going to be duty to pay because we've left, because of Brexit. But it gets rid of it only for certain negotiated goods, not for everything. And that's listed by its tariff code that we mentioned yes. earlier. So in each free trade agreement that will be negotiated, there is a list of tariff codes under what they call the origin protocol of goods that can have the reduced duties. But it's not good enough just to see that your item is listed there. What we also have to see is the origin rules in the free trade agreement. Now these rules determine what is the economic origin of your item. So if you imagine making something, you might make it from lots of components that came from lots of different countries. Mm -hmm. Conceivable. So how do you determine what your fin the origin of your finished thing is? You know, why isn't it Chinese because of that component or Thai because of that component? So it could be manufactured in the UK, but the components are coming all from around the world, therefore it's not really a UK thing. Well, it's not entirely British, no, mm. or, or UK, yes. So how do you determine that? Well, the rules tell you how you determine that. There is a rule per tariff code to determine how you work out, if you like, the origin of your product. So where do you find out more about the rules? They are in each individual free trade agreement. Goodness. So at the moment, let's say we have an EU-South Korea agreement. If you wanted to get your goods into South Korea duty-free, you need to look in the agreement, you need to find the origin protocol, you need to see if your tariff code is listed, and if it is, what is the rule next to it, uh, in order then to work out whether you meet the rule, and if you do, then you can have your duty-free access. Now the idea here is, at the moment with that agreement, how much EU content, what you might call EU-ness, mm. is there about your product. EU-ness, I love it. Yes, or Britishness or something, you know. How much of that is there in your product? Does it meet the rule? Because if there's not enough of it in your product in some way, then maybe you won't meet the rule and you won't get the discount. Can I try a question with you? There's yes. one just come in. Um, if we imported our duty-paid product, let's say it's hazmat chemical, into the UK, but then we need to send it to Germany to another toll site for formulation. How will the import procedure work regarding duty if pre-Brexit this material is charged duty if imported from China to Europe? Does that make sense? Can you say that again, just so I keep up so the detail? So if we imported our duty-paid product, let's say it's hazmat uh, chemical related. Into the UK. Into the UK, but then need to send it to Germany to another toll site for formulation. How will this import procedure work regarding duty if pre-Brexit this material is charged duty if imported from China to Europe? Well, when you import it to the UK, there is a single duty rate normally no matter where you import it from. The only time that changes, I mean to the whole of the EU at the moment, we're mm. all in the same club, so it's the same duty rate. So if it's coming from, doesn't really matter where, there is a duty set for it and you pay that on entry, unless you do one of the procedures that we spoke about earlier. So 
that stays. So that, that it's hazardous materials doesn't matter. It's that doesn't it's make it. That's that's not the same thing. You need hazardous regulations, but it's got nothing to do with the duty rate. Right. Some products do have special duty rates based on where they came from, and that's known as anti-dumping duty and countervailing duty. And they're imposed because it's thought the market is being undercut unfairly or there's government subsidies mm -hmm. which are causing the product to be super cheap. And the countervailing and anti-dumping is to, to level the marketplace. It's the sort of thing Mr Bush is applying right now to Chinese goods in America. His 25% is an anti-dumping, countervailing You mean Mr duty. Bush or Mr Trump? I'm sorry, I meant Mr Trump. Yes, Kay. showing my age there, Mr <laughs> Trump. Yes, the ones he's applying today. So that can happen, and sometimes it's goods from China that get that, but it can be goods from other places. And I don't know the particular product. I don't know all the anti-dumping regulations by heart, so I'm not sure if that's applying. But nonetheless, you paid your duty into the UK. Now you're moving it post-Brexit into Germany. EU duty rates will apply to the import into Germany. So potentially you've paid the duties and taxes twice. Now, if we had anti-dumping into the UK for China, and you had anti-dumping, Europe had levied anti-dumping for China on this product, you're paying an enhanced rate of duty twice. But you could also have, we don't levy it into the UK, but the Europeans do, so you've got to pay the enhanced duty into Europe. It's, you know, extra duties. Now, how do you mitigate any of that? Well, you use the special procedures. Because if you put it into a warehouse in the UK, you don't pay the duty. You can then move it on to Europe, maybe they've got inward processing relief, so they won't pay the duty. Clever. Then when you want to send it back to the UK, they finish off their, their IPR, they never pay the duty, maybe you import it back again to the warehouse. Very elegant. You see, there are things you can do. In the end, a finished product will end up perhaps being imported and some money will be need to, to be paid, but do you need to pay duty multiple times? Not if you do it right. If that was your question, please let us know if we've understood it correctly, first of all, and if that answer makes sense to you. But thank you for that. There's a quick follow-on from someone else. Where can we find the rules for my particular product? That seems like a very sensible question. With a rather more awkward answer. Um, <laughs> because the rules are contained in each free trade agreement. Now, we don't yet have a free trade agreement with the EU because we're not allowed to negotiate one until we've left. So we don't know the rules that will apply in that agreement at this time, not negotiated. If you want to see existing rules and examples of existing rules, look in current EU free trade agreements, actually look in the agreement under the Origin Protocol. There's also a HMRC, a customs notice you can look up. Notice 828 is what you would search for. Notice 828, make yeah. a note of that. And that contains some rules about the products, current EU free trade agreements that we're part of. We can't say they will be the rules for our free trade agreement with Europe, but it would be something similar. Where are you finding Notice 828, is that? If you Google it, it's online. All it's right. for free. Okay. It's not a problem. There HMRC Notice 828. There you go. Uh, I believe there's a link as well that may be provided. Amazing, you've notice. got this in your head. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> it's long practice, I'm afraid. Uh, so you can look up the rules. There's not just one type of rule, though. Some people say, oh, that's the 60-40 rule. But of course, that's just one sort of origin rule, and which is why I was talking about how much EU content there might be, or post-Brexit, how much UK content there might be. So it could be 80-20, it could be 70-30, it could be anything? It could be anything, and it could not be a percentage at all. The rule, there are different sorts of rules. Now, this is why when we leave, if there is a free trade agreement, you're beginning to think about your component origin for your product that you're making in the UK, because it might not come under the free trade agreement because it hasn't got enough UK-ness in it. Because too much of your components or ingredients are coming from outside mm -hmm. the UK. Mm -hmm. Because these, these agreements are based on origin. And, and how much of, if it's EU South Korea, how much EU-ness is in it and how much South Korean-ness is in it. You know, this is what matters. So some companies are having to think about their components and where they get them from and whether they might ought to look at that differently in order to assess, maybe I need a bit more of the British market. So they will change the suppliers? You recommend change people change suppliers? suppliers? I, you can't say how much is going to apply or if even their item will be in the free trade agreement. That's a big deal, though, to change the suppliers. It is, but it's something that needs looking at um, in preparedness for if you might have to do it. This is the thing, because EU origin today, so you might have French origin and German plus British origin, 
in your product and it all counts as EU. So when you add it all together, it meets the need and you go into South Korea duty free. Of course, with a UK South Korea agreement, if we ever sign one, that EU content won't count because it's not UK content. Notice 828, back to that. There's a link in the text chat. Thank you for that, as if by magic. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got to worry about that um, going forward with the free trade agreements. You still need customs declarations and you will need a document that proves your goods meet the rules of origin. And those rules are not just the 60, 40. Mm. It can be add up all the, look at all the components, look at where they come from and see based on country, which country of the list of components you've got has the biggest value as components. So whichever one has the biggest value becomes the origin of the product, even if you're making it in the UK. So a manufacturer side of manufacturing doesn't really apply. So it, it has something to do with it, but in that rule it would not. It would only be the list of components. There is another sort of rule where it is a process must be done. The suits I mentioned earlier, that's complete making up. So wherever you had the fabric cut and turned into a suit, that becomes the country of origin. So there's a, it is the most complex, it's a sort of matrix arrangement, it's most complex area. Doesn't sound like an easement to me. Work. That sounds oh, this, well it, the, the it opposite isn't of an easement. easement. Diseasement. <laughs> it's, it's current re legislation. Okay. We, we work with it today. It's out there already. And some companies use it to very great advantage. For others it's impossible. I mean imagine if you're building a product with lots of components from lots of countries, you've worked it all out, you've met the rule, you're getting your discounts, and then your procurement department says, oh, well, I can buy these components from a different supplier in a different country. They're cheaper. You know, this is excellent. We'll bring them in. Great cost saving. But actually, it destroys mm. your ability to import them into South Korea duty free. Wrong criteria. I Maybe, understand. you know, their saving is less than you were saving on the duty. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be very cautious about origin under free trade agreements. We have 10 minutes remaining. So any questions or comments that you want to uh, put up, please let us know. Oh, there is one. Just come in. Oh. Thank you. Um, so, will cargo returning on supply vessels from offshore rigs need to be cleared by customs and duty paid before it can be moved from the quayside post-Brexit? First part. Well, if I can answer that, that depends where your oil rig is or your gas rig. If it's on the continental shelf, which is UK territory, within our waters, no. If it's outside the continental shelf that is UK waters, Yes. There's a follow-on. It could be waste for disposal or to a warehouse to be serviced or cleaned or a tool to be stored until next time it's needed. If it's within our territorial waters, not an issue. Carry on. Okay. If it's outside the territorial waters, you need customs documentation. You might need IPR. You might need something else because um, to you get away with the duty because you've left the territory of the UK. So, Ross, uh, where is it? and uh, those territorial waters, I'm sure you know the boundaries. There's your answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you. So we move on now to the trusted trader answer, uh, which we wanted. And that, at the moment, the only trusted trader scheme we have is Authorised Economic Operator, AEO. That's a global scheme. It's not just an EU scheme, it's a global scheme. And it measures a company up against very best practice, you know, absolutely excellent best practice, both in doing customs work and in supply chain security. So how you look after your supply chain, all of it, you know, the length of it. And very, you've got to be self-policing, you've got to be self-aware, you've got to be compliant, you've got to be really secure and worried about the security of your product in the supply chain. Who are you using? What do they do? You know, how secure are they? And if you measure up, customs can award you the AEO sort of badge, if you like. At the moment, it's the EU scheme, because we're part of the EU, that we would sign up to. Post-Brexit, there will be a UK scheme. Anyone who's got an EU AEO will be swapped automatically to the UK scheme. You don't have to do anything. It will, you'll get sent a new certificate with a new logo. We don't know what the logo is yet, but customs do, but they're teasing us by not letting us see it. <laughs> wow, can't um, wait. There's so a question on that. Do, that's a good, good question. Do customers charge for AEO accreditation? They do not. But the only cost you might get is your own man hours. Because, of course, to ensure you are that compliant and secure, you have to do a certain amount of work right. and time, and that's where the cost comes in. So, no, they don't actually charge. 
But AEO is the scheme that we have. It gives benefits. If it's customs, you get AEOC, then you get benefits of ease of getting those special procedures. You get an easier process to comply with. Um, if it's security, you actually get benefits at the ports. You get put to the front of the queue. Nice. You get moved through easier and quicker without so many checks, because that gives you a low risk score. And the lower your risk score, the less interference from customs there will be. Because the point of being a trusted trader, an AEO, is they can turn their back on you because you're self-policing and know what you're doing, and they can go after the naughty people. So it's worth your while to find out how to get that. It is. It is worth your while. It's global recognition. It applies around the world. Some countries have different names for it, like CTPAT in America, Customs uh, Tra and Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. Funny names, but nonetheless, it's the same scheme. It's an AEO scheme. So that's worth looking into and is a possible application for the Northern Ireland Trusted Trader if that comes to pass, uh, as we think. And it, any, in any event, it's excellent preparation for post-Brexit mm -hmm. because, of course, you've done your work, you understand customs, you understand the supply chain, and you're at the top of the game. So that is really good for post-Brexit preparation. And then the last thing I'd like to mention is that right now, the government is giving to people in the UK, to companies in the UK, free money. Giving? Yes, giving, no strings. Free money. They put 16 million plus into this scheme. Whoa. So if you're in the UK, you're a UK company, and you're doing anything at all to do with customs work, you don't have to be a freight agent, you can be a trader, anyone like that, doing customs work, you can apply very quickly and easily online for a grant for training for your staff. If you want them to have better customs knowledge, maybe they didn't have it already and or you want to improve it, you can get 100% of the cost of the training course, up to £2,250 per employee per course. So accommodation and food and travel and stuff? Not included, the cost just, of the course. Just the course? Cost of the course, which ah. nevertheless is quite a large That's amount. pretty good. And there's no um, level, you, it doesn't say how many courses or how many people, is, as is many no times as you like. The only limit is in total for your company, you can't exceed 200,000 euros. Per company? Per company. And that's, that's still an awful lot of money for training uh, for your staff. It can also be covered for in-house training, but that's a lower limit of 250 pounds per employee. Is per there course. a question, is there a limit on the number of training courses that a government grants will cover for any one company? No. So any number of training? Any number of training. As long as it doesn't meet that ceiling point. That ceiling of 200,000 euros. Right, there you go. Good question, yes, thank any you. any number of training. Now in addition to that, as if that were not enough money, they are also for what they call intermediaries. This has to be freight agents, customs brokers, logistics sort of people. Um, for IT, so if you need more computer kit to cope with customs post-Brexit, you can apply for a grant, a 100% grant, or up to 100%, wow. but you have to be of a certain size, less than 250 employees and so on. You can get a grant for hardware, software, training in how to use it, and installation fees and all that sort of thing, uh, which is uh, up to 200,000 euros. That's good. So you can go out and buy new software, whatever you need, to move that forward and increase the uh, availability, if you like, to the world, to the UK, of customs processing. You can also now get a grant as an intermediary for recruiting new staff. So training, kit and people? Yes, absolutely. And you, for this, an intermediary, a freight agent or someone like that, can say, well, I need more staff to do the extra customs entries that people mm. are going to be asking for. And you can get up to 13,000 per new employee, that's 13,000 uh, pounds, per employee, which will cover advertising costs using a, um, a recruitment agency, anything like that, um, and their training and things like that, plus the first three months' salary. Wow. Uh, we've got about a minute left. Uh, there's a question in just squeaked in the end. Does CLT, CILT offer any courses which could be el eligible for the training grants? They do. They offer two. One is called the AEO Certified Practitioner, which is a four-day course which trains people to go into companies, if you like, and put the AEO program in. So to help the company get it, to tell them what they need to do, and get rid of all the fog and the doubt and the confusion, home in on exactly what needs to be done and do it in the most economic and sensible way. Mm -hmm. 
There's another one called the Certificate of Customs Competency, kind of self-explanatory title, which is a five-day course which teaches people to know all the stuff about customs, some of which we've spoken about today, so they are a safe pair of hands. And putting either on your CV is showing scarce skills because these are actually certified programs. You get a certificate at the end of it. Brilliant. And don't forget, this course, this what you've done today, is also available as a face-to-face -face from the CRLT. And I think you're teaching on that I program am, as yes. well. Uh, you'll see some dates on the screen shortly and the contact details uh, there next week. So book yourself on those if you haven't seen that link already. It was the uh, link earlier on. Um, we pretty much run out of time. You said that the, the, the recruitment thing is closing date January. 31st of January 2020. Great. So get in there quickly. Or when the money runs out. Who knows when that's going to be. <laughs> so we're going to finish now. Susan, thank you so thank much. You. There does seem to be almost nothing that you don't know about this topic. <laughs> but if you that. want more, if you want more, <laughs> book yourself on those face-to-face -face training sessions which are taking place next week. Um, thank you. Please stay in touch with the CILT. They are with you on the journey through Brexit, wherever and whenever that happens. Um, some nice thank you from here. Thank you for attendance. Um, there'll be a post pack that'll be emailed out to each delegate uh, with the slide materials and the recording will be made available too. Uh, if you had to leave them with one, one or two or three words, what would it be to people watching? Customs procedures may seem difficult, but actually they're very beneficial if you use them properly. They're not a hindrance, they're an enabler. There you go, more than two or three words, but uh, they're yes, an enabler. Sorry. Don't be frightened, <laughs> don't be frightened. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Please stay in touch. Uh, we'll see you online later. Thank you.